Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's event. I am Bianca Gerani, President and CEO of Aperio Philanthropy, co-host for today's event alongside our friends at NYU School of Professional Studies. Aperio is a nonprofit consulting firm with a vision for a world in which everyone can thrive. We exist to unleash the power of community to drive change by dramatically expanding resources for nonprofits. Day to day, we work alongside community leaders and fundraisers to develop simpler, faster, and smarter ways to generate revenue for their missions. Our client services provide strategic advisory, hands-on project support, and embedded fundraisers to organizations nationwide. As a firm created to drive change, we're thrilled to be hosting this event series with NYU. For the past few years, we've been facilitating conversations among thought leaders about the role of philanthropy in driving change and solving complex societal problems. Today's event will address housing access and equity. It's my pleasure to turn it over to our co-host for today, Michelle D'Amico. Thanks, Bianca. Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle D'Amico, and I'm the Director of Continuing Education and Public Programs at the NYU SPS Center for Global Affairs, or CGA. Since its founding, our goal at CGA has been to prepare global citizens to make a positive impact in the world. We do this through a variety of activities, including our two graduate programs, one in global affairs and another MS in global security, conflict, and cybercrime. We also offer a wide variety of skills and knowledge-based continuing education courses and offer public events such as this that expand upon the topics that we cover in our classrooms. We are very proud to be home to the George H. Heyman Jr. Program for Fundraising and Philanthropy. Through our open enrollment courses and certificates in fundraising and digital fundraising, we offer professionally oriented educational options for those looking to enter or grow within the fundraising field. Courses are taught by practitioner faculty who bring their vast experience, expertise, and networks to the classroom. We'll send a follow-up message to all attendees, so please feel free to reach out to us with any questions you might have about these programs. Additionally, we've also reserved some time at the end of today's event for questions from the audience, so please feel free to submit yours via the Q&A tool. And now, I'm delighted to introduce you to today's moderator. Professor Kay is the director of the NYU Urban Lab, where he recently published NYC's Affordable Housing Crisis in partnership with AIA NY. He is also the managing partner of the advisory and impact investment firm, Q Partners, and has worked on inclusive growth and community development strategies for former New York City Mayor de Blasio, Augusta, Georgia Mayor Deke Copenhaver, and Austin Mayor Steve Adler, where he also published the NEA funded study thriving in place, supporting Austin's cultural vitality. He sits on the Urban Lab Institute's National Public-Private Partnership Council and the Curtis Infrastructure Forum. Matt, the virtual floor is all yours. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Bianca. I'm really happy to be a, a part of this panel. Um, it is truly a great topic. Um, here we are um, talking about how philanthropy can advance housing equity. I just want to thank again the Aperio Philanthropy and also um, George H. Heyman Jr. Program for Philanthropy and Fundraising. I'm really excited to be here. Um, as Michelle said, uh, I'm a professor at the Shack Institute of Real Estate at NYU um, and also the director of the NYU uh, Urban Lab uh, at the Shack Institute. We are pleased to have industry professionals um, across the spectrum of the industry of public and private real estate and definitely are extremely focused on issues of inclusive growth. Uh, the NYU Urban Lab, which I direct, uh, is focused on becoming the country's center for understanding impact real estate. We focus on inclusive growth, including housing and economic development, as well as on sustainable infrastructure and development and public-private partnerships, ESG and impact formation. Um, as of uh, this fall, we'll be offering a new concentration specifically in impact development and if you're interested in that, you can reach out to us at SPS. Our model of inclusive growth is based on a UN model called Integrated Local Area Development, um, also called the Quadruple Bottom Line, which integrates economic prosperity with social equality, environmental sustainability, and cultural vitality. Today, uh, we are talking about how philanthropy can advance housing equity. And we have some key questions uh, that we will be exploring today uh, listed here. 
I am really excited to uh, explore in this conversation how philanthropists and fundraisers have been, and also should be, approaching support for accessible, affordable, and secure housing. When we address housing concerns, it really requires us as a community of nonprofit leaders, fundraisers, advocates, and people with lived experience themselves to adopt a theory of change based on systems level change. To ground today's conversation, I want us to think about the role colonization has played and continues to play in both housing inequity, the challenge that we're discussing today, and in philanthropy, which is one of the solutions to housing inequity that we're discussing today. So now it's my pleasure to introduce this distinguished panel. Um, as I say their names, they will appear. Uh, first, Cy Richardson, who is Senior Vice President for Programs at the National Urban League, and he is a member of the League's Executive Leadership Team. Cy is a recognized and respected expert on housing and community development, job creation, and racial wealth equity, and is a sought-after thought leader on issues related to building a more inclusive economy. Aubrey Merriman is the Chief Executive Officer of Life Moves, an organization in Menlo Park, California, dedicated to helping individuals and families experiencing homelessness to return to stable housing and self-sufficiency. Aubrey also serves on the Board of Directors for Santa Clara County's Continuum of Care, Opportunity Center, HDC Inc., HOPE, which is Housing Our People Effectively, Interagency Council, and KIPP Charter Schools of Northern California, as well as SV at Home. And finally, Kyle Bennett is the Senior Director of Policy and Equity at United Way of Rhode Island, and is at the forefront of addressing affordable housing in the state. Kyle also serves as the chair of the Housing Resources Commission in Rhode Island, which is the state's planning and policy standards and programs agency for housing issues. So as you can see, we have an incredible panel here. I am so thrilled to be with you all and learn from you today. Um, this is really just a, a great community to bring together to talk about these issues. I wanna start um, with a question for all of you so that uh, we get a little flavor of how you're thinking about this. Housing equity uh, is an incredibly complex issue. Uh, for those in the audience who are new to the issue, can each of you help us understand the emerging landscape? What opportunities do you see in the landscape for housing equity? And why is philanthropy specifically important to seizing those opportunities? I'd like to start in the, in the order that I introduced you, if that's all right with you. So Sai, that would make you our first speaker. Sure, I appreciate that, Matt. Thanks very much. Um, you know, the, the, the perennial kind of North Star for the National Urban League is to understand the kind of different vectors and, and variables um, that fuels and accelerates the racial wealth gap. That's our, uh, that's our, uh, the alpha and the omega of our work. What, the kind of antecedents of, 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 that, uh, of that platform are to understand the various gaps that fuel and animate um, th that kind of societal conundrum. And again, this is where the limitations of government reveal themselves. Um, and I think this is where philanthropy must um, kind of, you know, um, cheek by jowl work with other sectors to kind of understand and support the kind of meta argument we're trying to make, which is equality while kind of um, embedded in the Urban League's values and our branding, the equal sign, um, differs from the urgency um, requiring equity, which um, also brings with it the um, kind of um, unabashed call and necessity to kind of grapple with race. Race is the, um, you know, kind of central to what um, uh, Americana is. And I think, you know, in the kind of post George Floyd kind of moment and movement, um, we have, you know, the ability to talk about race um, unabashedly and unashamedly. Um, and to, you know, to see people kind of shift uneasily in their seats is part of my job and our role at the moment. And again, talking about what are the boosts and blocks for helping communities of color, household and their balance sheets um, preserve and resiliently retain their role in, in the mainstream systems of civil society. This necessarily, given um, the, um, the, the data points we're grappling with, requires questions around equity and kind of equity gained and sustained through housing and home ownership has been the central way that folks build wealth and transfer intergenerationally. So I think the, the, the main point I'd like to kind of impart here is that um, this is, uh, I'll say, our moment, this kind of, um, this kind of a FUBU moment, as we call it, the for us, by us, talking about the needs of 
minority-led, minority-serving institutions to have these very important and difficult and uncomfortable conversations uh, about race, class, and the difference and differential um, uh, between the terms and ethos of equality um, and equity. And you know, we're really pushing, pushing and privileging home ownership. We believe that is what everyone should be on ultimately in their own rate and pace on the, the kind of um, trajectory towards. The main issue for us are what are the, the boosts and blocks to ensuring full participation? And again, the, our philanthropic partners and, and commentators are best apt and most agile um, in terms of understanding and being able to um, um, catalyze um, and incent the nonprofit sector um, as, as laboratories of innovation and change to double down in many ways on what we know works and to take that kind of scaffold to scale. And again, we're talking about bringing folks who may not have an historic and legacy connection, connection and experience with asset building through home ownership. This is a moonshot of an effort. Um, it's embodied in, 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 a, in a, a project that we're working on. I'll talk about a bit later called the Black Home Ownership Collaborative, which privileges equity um, in, in, in its values. Um, and the main point I'd like to kind of you know, leave with you is that um, now is the time, now is the moment. If we um, you know, are, are comfortable with you know, um, a large semi-permanent subsection of American society um, renting and being satisfied with that tenure, then I think we have a problem. We, we, we need to make sure we have folks on the path and trajectory towards ownership. And again, this is where we inject the, the value, theme, and concept of equity. Thank you, Sai. Really appreciate those opening uh, remarks. Uh, Aubrey, uh, you're up next. Uh, Sai, I appreciate you laying the, the foundation here. And I have a couple of points that I'll, I'll try to amplify and, and hopefully add some additional perspective there. Uh, with regards to... Um, life moves, our job, we exist to end homelessness. We're centered in Silicon Valley. We're um, part of the state of California, which would be the fourth largest economy of the world. We live in the richest region and the richest state and the richest country on the face of the earth. And we have people that are falling into homelessness as we speak. And we're in the middle of a housing crisis and life moves role is to move people off the streets because we don't believe the streets should be the waiting room to try to uh, access affordable housing and to be able to live in places that are suitable for human habitation. So that's sort of the context. What we see largely is that no matter what philanthropic lens that you use to view housing justice, racial equity is the focal point. And so part of the elevation of our conversations of what we're trying to engage philanthropy in is those hard conversations around racial equity, right? Picking up on the decolonizing philanthropy uh, webinar that you had recently, all the themes, all the historical pillars from which this country was founded and um, for which the system that was architected is delivering the results it was intended to deliver. Black and brown folks aren't able to access home ownership. We are disproportionately represented in the population of people experiencing homelessness. We are certainly outside the bubble of home ownership. Um, most people that rent are black and brown folks that are renting out there. And so what we find ourselves in, in California, I'm sure in other states around the United States to different degrees, is this huge housing crisis. And a lot of the work that we are seeing um, is really around the concept of how do we uh, protect, um, how do we preserve and how do we produce enough housing so that everybody can afford uh, to live. And I think it's, it's the confluence of those three factors and looking at are we producing at, at the right rate and not producing to uh, not producing to um, the demand, because there is a lot of demand out there, but the demand is for largely middle class, affordable housing where people are just economically, you know, oppressed from engaging in that. So um, we suffer from a chronic shortage of affordable housing. And so how do we create more places to live and as well as improve housing security for people who do not have homes? How do we preserve and protect renters so that they don't find themselves sort of flipped on their head? How do we address and confront the fact that a lot of the COVID protection 
um, eviction moratoriums are starting to fade? How are we positioning policy conversations and narratives around that? How does philanthropy influence some of those policy discussions? And how are we engaging our voices of lived experience that was mentioned before to really help drive um, the framework for how we want to approach this? The last thing I say as I wrap up these, these opening um, comments, size, I really loved how you talked about equality and equity. And, and I would just humbly add to that, um, you know, racial, the racial equity lens separates the symptoms from the causes. And then the racial justice lens brings into view the confrontation of power, the redistribution of resources, and the systemic transformations necessary for real change. And so what we're excited about with today's conversation, and hopefully it triggers momentum around, we have to get past putting micro band-aids on macro problems. And I think once, once we start to expand the conversations, expand the strategies, embrace the moment that we're in, I think that we can create the type of needle moving that's necessary for us to consider ourselves being progressive in this space. Thank you, Aubrey. Uh, Kyle, uh, now you can give us maybe the perspective of a funder and fundraiser into uh, the lens that we're looking through here. Thank you, Matthew, and I appreciate both Cy and Aubrey and the opening remarks. At United Way of Rhode Island, our strategic plan calls for the elimination of racial disparities. We focus on racial equity from a perspective of providing a safe, affordable, healthy place for everyone to call home, whether that's home ownership, an affordable apartment, a condo, making sure that everyone lives indoors. They have a place where their belongings remain at night when they leave for work, when they leave for school. You know, during the pandemic, we realized that as we asked people to learn from home and to earn from home, that a significant portion of our population was not only already living outdoors, but there were those who were on the fringe, on the verge, living on a couch of a friend or a neighbor. Um, so they were not safe and stably housed. We also look at it from an income perspective, ensuring that incomes increase to a point where individuals or families are able to earn family sustaining wages that they can begin to think about and, and plan for the unexpected, uh, the emergency that comes up when the car crashes and dies and needs to repair, when the medical system that doesn't provide enough support for families fails to provide support and you have to dig in your pocket deeper to get the basic service that you need just to remain healthy enough to go back to school and back to work. And then lastly, the notion of education ensuring that our kids who are black and brown in our public and private systems have the same opportunities to learn and engage and plan and ideate around their future as everyone else in our community. So we, we focus on those three primary buckets of area and really, um, again, move back to the perspective of eliminating the racial disparity from that, from that perspective. So I'll, I'll hold on additional comments because there's a lot more that I wanna say, but I appreciate the chance to open with brief remarks today. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, and we're gonna get a lot more chance for all of you to speak more. Um, I'll, I'll continue with one more question um, for all of you. Maybe we'll go in reverse order this time um, just to hear a different, a different round. Um, you talked a little bit about your lens on the conversation, um, what equity means, what you're working toward. Um, as I said earlier, this is a bit of a complex issue. What do you see emerging uh, in the landscape and why, what do you see as emerging solutions and why do you think philanthropy specifically is important to seize or build upon those opportunities? We, we heard about some of your strategies and what you see. Now, what are some of the emerging things that might be working with philanthropy or that you can see can work with philanthropy in order to move the conversation forward? Um, so Kyle, why don't you start please, sir? I'm so glad you asked the question in that way, Matthew. Uh, as you mentioned, United Way is both a funder, a philanthropist, as well as an investor in our community's activity. So we raise money and invest it. What we're seeing as we move from a traditional fundraising perspective to a truly trust-based model where we identify partners who are doing amazing work in the community and provide unrestricted funds for their support so they can use the dollars as they see fit to close the gaps in finance, to close the gaps in opportunity for the populations they serve. We've seen that that doesn't necessarily resonate with the donor, with the investor. We find that it's still difficult for folks to let go of the reins. And I think this gets to your earlier question of the historical nature of disinvestment, the historical nature of patriarchy, the historical nature, as I said, of America. 
really thinking about who has the power, who has the control, and how we determine the type of investment per community to determine the outcomes that we're really seeking. And our model has changed significantly. So as we find the rub against potentially the donor intent versus the organization's intent, our goal continues to be the same, to move our community forward, to actually see the needle increase in opportunity for populations that have been at the worst or the lowest end of economic outcomes and opportunities, at the lowest end of education and economic outcomes, at the lowest end of all positive outcomes, but at the highest end of all, of all outcomes that you would expect to be negative, such as incarceration rates, health outcomes, income disparities. So that's really been our rub, making sure that as we move along as an organization, we're able to engage the donor fully in the discussion around trust-based philanthropy. So they understand that if they truly wanna move the dial, they can't be as prescriptive about the strategy to invest and the methodology for improving outcomes that we have to trust in and leave the work to our partners who are actually doing that that work on the ground and at the strategy level. Thank you. And I know those words, trust-based philanthropy, may be new for some people in the audience. So do you want to just give a little succinct? You, you kind of just did, but give it to us one more time so make sure we don't miss it. Yeah, I appreciate that. Trust-based philanthropy is a relatively new concept. Um, it, it takes away the preconceived notion that the funder knows best. It allows the agency or organizations that are invested in to do the work that they are experts in. Um, as a funder, we might have thoughts or ideas, but recognizing that folks who are in the trenches, who have tried solutions year in, year out, who have tested theories, who have evaluated performance and come back to the table with new theories and strategies based on those evaluations are truly the experts in the field. Similar to if we were going to a medical professional and we would trust that the doctor has been trained, if we went to a legal professional, we trust that the lawyer has been educated. When we go to a nonprofit partner, an investor in the nonprofit space has to trust in that organization to be able to deliver in the same fashion with the same expectations of excellent results. And, and it's fine to ask for the report back. That's not a, it's not a non-starter. The question is, should we tell them how to do the job that they are uh, they are better and able to do on their own than without our influence or interference. Thank you for that. And we're starting to touch on issues of decolonization and philanthropy. We'll get to that in a moment, but uh, I want to turn to um, Aubrey as one of the recipients of uh, philanthropy and ask you um, the same question, but also uh, how is that going in terms of how are you receiving or not receiving that type of trust-based philanthropy? Thanks for asking that. And uh, Kyle, I appreciate your comments. And one of the things about being in the middle is reverse order. You always know where you're going to be. So this is great. Um, <laughs> but yeah, trust-based philanthropy is key. Um, and sometimes there's a dissidence between hearing the value of trust-based philanthropy and the structural architect that reminds you of the paternalistic approach. Uh, and if you could just go on our website and fill out this 52 page application and then we get quarterly progress reports, then we got to do a site visit. So now you're responsible for the pageantry of a dog and pony show and to sort of make us feel good, throw in a client or two so we can really feel good about the funding that we're offering. So I can go back and tell my board, you know, I just met somebody who was unsheltered and my gosh, I really feel good about the work that we're doing. And so I want to be honest about how that dynamic, there is sort of still that, that artifact that's out there that we live in that's real. Um, but I also think going back to my original point, I think um, trust-based philanthropy is the way to go. And I think that it's trust-based philanthropy is, I think before it was named that and before the concept became more sort of widespread, I think um, BIPOC leaders didn't have the benefit of trust-based philanthropy. We had to spend so much time justifying the qualifications for being in the seat that our um, persons of non-color our counterparts did not have. So I just want to acknowledge that as well too. So there's a different level of approving oneself in certain seats. Um, and the fact that you have Sai, Kyle and myself here uh, means that you're able to somehow um, corral three unicorns in the same universe. So, so that's um, amazing. But if you, if you center racial justice in housing, it affects how and with whom and uh, we interact as much as it shapes how we spend our how we spend our funds so a lot of the conversations that we are entering in is making sure that we are able to open the aperture around thinking about uh alongside targeting grant making and prioritize can you prioritize grants uh to uh, 
public benefit corporations that are led by people of color? Can you support and partner projects that develop BIPOC leadership um, to build the power of the BIPOC communities? Um, that's still new for philanthropy, and that's still new in the trust building and the in the trust part of the trust-based philanthropy. Um, but it's going to become more core part of how we want to seek funds and how I think funding is going to happen. That would be my hope. I think the challenge and the opportunity for philanthropy is to go beyond the usual networks to find more diverse grantees, right? You sometimes know who you know, and there's some credibility that's built there and, and sort of maybe one trade-off for trust-based philanthropy is you have a core group that you trust and that's your group, right? And so it's hard to expand the sidelines for trust because that takes time and um, it's easier to go with what you know. And so just to encourage that sort of expansion um, and, and fund organizations with different resources, different missions, different size and different experiences. And I think the other thing that I, I, would, I would share too is that um, as grantees, as people that are on the other side of philanthropy, one of the things that would be really helpful and refreshing is in that trust-based philanthropy relationship is to be incentivized to innovate and fail forward. So often you get concerned about, I have, to, I have to create that sexy grant report. And I don't know that I wanna take the risk to go, hey, we told you we wanted to do eight objectives. We got three, but we learned a hell of a lot and we're gonna iterate and ideate. That's a risky proposition if you don't know your funder and if they're not walking in lockstep with what you're doing uh, to be able to put yourself out there. So in a lot of ways, it's been historically structured as a disincentive to innovate and, and sort of put yourself out there. And that's the level that it's gonna take for us to be able to sort of move the needle. So it's really around, you know, no matter what lens we use, um, it's about racial equity as a focal point. It's about really encouraging collaboration and, and how, how does philanthropy encourage collaboration in a way that's natural. Uh, collaboration happens at the speed of trust. So how do you stack philanthropy in such a way that I don't have to figure out what size agenda is compared to my agenda when we're going to Kyle to get my money. Um, and that we're bickering over the slice of the pie, uh, whose slice is bigger. So how do you create the landscape where this collaboration can happen more authentically? And then the last thing as you, you'll hear is, as the theme is, how does philanthropy say we are not the experts? Maybe the folks who are running these institutions aren't the experts, but a novel idea. Maybe the people who are living and who have been historically oppressed, who are closest to the issue, may in fact have some insight that might be help, uh, helpful, right? And so I think that's sort of the, the positioning. Again, the pandemic created this abrupt, abrupt paradigm shift. My challenge, my concern, is that we don't regress back to the mean and that we don't sort of slowly go back to the, the structures that we had pre-pandemic. And so um, that's, that's what I'm seeing. Um, and we're still figuring out how to structure long-term relationships with ph philanthropy, how to structure long-term relationships with people with lived experience. Um, so that way their choices and perspectives can influence, you know, what we do in a non-tokenized way. And so there is a lot there, but I just think not separating racial justice um, and the racial inequities from all the conversations. I think of it as a, as a real complicated wheel. And if you just try to fix one spoke in that wheel, you're not gonna fix the wheel. So you have to be willing to embrace the fact that you wanna look at the entire wheel. You wanna look at the intersectionality and confront those things head on. And hopefully philanthropy will walk with you shoulder by shoulder as you're doing this work, even when it doesn't feel good. Great, great comments. Thank you so much for all of that, Aubrey. Um, Sai, we're going to turn it to you. And um, the question, again, to, more focused for you. Have you seen some things in the philanthropy world that are addressing some of the issues you brought up earlier about advancing home ownership? Has there been some actual changes besides a lot of talk and panels? Have we seen some actual solutions emerging? Um, well, I th we've seen both. And, and just quickly, I just um, really, really want to, you know, really subscribe to Kyle's points and really Aubrey's. You have me walking around my own office with a skip in my step, Aubrey, because that's exactly um, how we see um, and operationalize our role and potential impact for my organization and my sector. So right on with that. Um, um, I would like to just say that I think 
the, 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 the trust and collaboration, those two kind of bookends are, are, are definitely important factors for us. Um, this whole notion of trust and, and how do you engender trust, how do you break trust actually as well, um, sometimes can be at the expense of the point that you made earlier around the desire for philanthropists um, and investors to, to innovate in dynamic and impactful ways to, 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 to satisfy their bottom line or the folks that they are but beholden to um, as, in their stakeholder organization um, working groups. Not unimportant, but I think the main takeaway for me is that I have, we have seen um, philanthropy, again, this notion of opening up the aperture to kind of understand the importance of home ownership as an important kind of, you know, pathway um, and, and vector into the, you know, the wealth building conversation. But really, you know, how do we harness and use language in the terms of art and industry, which sometimes separate and, and atomize us from funders? How can we come to shared, um, you know, terms of art and language? I think in this case, the home ownership question really should be or can be kind of kind of assumed under a broader kind of financial health lens, which is where I think the biggest tent where all of us can reside. The unpleasantness unnecessarily so around kind of CRT and, you know, kind of um, um, the kind of freedom to learn, which is our counter to, to, to the kind of rights kind of critique of, of CRT, which is the big tent is around how do we promote financial health? Again, not because we suspect it's foundational. We have decades and generations of knowing its centrality and how to build strong, resilient communities. I think the, the degree to which philanthropists have built in the mechanisms to um, hear, listen, and adaptively act on those lessons in terms of where their investments are, where they're supporting the notion of other institutions and the impact they're making. I have seen movement, have seen a difference. Again, the perennial tension is though, that um, dynamic grant makers, you know, want to be dynamic and innovative and, and, and special and extraordinary. I get that because the league is not just a think tank, but a do tank. And we fund our affiliates um, in, in much of this frontline work. But as I say, we don't suspect that we understand the boosts and blocks of the racial wealth gap. We know, we have knowledge, we have data, we have experience. Experientially is how, what, what legitimizes our role on this panel and, 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 and other forums across the country. I do think our philanthropic partners ability to step back and share agency and how we define community and how we create those voices and pockets of trust um, are, are, are own, can only be achieved through the kind of trust-based collaboration that Aubrey was talking about. So I think, I do think we're in this kind of moment where um, you know, folks are, are looking for um, great ideas, the right kind of scaffolding, what do we know that works? And what kind of investments required to take that to scale? And how do we define scale? Rather than funding something on Monday, getting the evaluation report on Wednesday, and then, and then kind of jettisoning it and funding something else by Friday, that kind of, kind of you know, um, philanthropic schizophrenia, I'm hoping we've passed that. Now, if we have kind of the centrality of financial health and, and the importance of home ownership within that, um, how do we prepare communities for that? Um, that's a much better place for us to reside. And we'll be excited about that. Great comments. I, I'm really excited to talk with you offline on some work we're doing in the Urban Lab about asking the question about the 30% rent burden and whether or not that's actually the right question to ask because you actually need to expand out and look at everything that a family and household yes. is trying to buy. Sometimes that 30% is too much. Sometimes it's too little, yes. but the conversation is sort of directed in the wrong way in New York City yes. here. We have half the renter population rent burdened and half the units are rent regulated. So what's going on there? It's not quite working. Um, I do want to zoom out a little bit and get us uh, uh, on the housing train um, a little bit more specifically and the uh, decolonization train uh, a little bit more specifically. Um, giving a little background for those in the audience, um, federal programs, if we go back to urban renewal or through redlining and even I would argue opportunity zones, have truly exacerbated housing inequity, particularly in communities of color. Um, and nonprofit and philanthropy are complicit in creating this problem of colonization, and yet they're also central to the solution. In the US, the design of philanthropy itself resembles a lot of elements of colonial social architecture. So we have the bureaucracy, the competition, the specializ specialization, and consolidation of power and resources. Um, historically, philanthropy has reinforced the frameworks of inequity through funding priorities that are dictating solutions from a colonial lens rather than elevating solutions as, as Aubrey was talking about, solutions that can be 
co-designed with communities and giving agency to the communities that are served. One of the issues here is the very structure of philanthropic giving, which is focused on a competition for scarce resources. So in that, as, as a context, um, mostly uh, for the audience, I know you all are very aware of all those items, but um, using that as a jumping off point, I wanna go back to you, Sai, and, and ask, you know, in this movement moment, following the protests in the wake of George Floyd's murder, philanthropists and funders faced a lot of pressure to change both who they funded and how they fund with more of a focus on racial justice. But have we seen change? Have we seen how donors are approaching things differently in the housing realm? And have we seen any level of urgency or pick up both on the issue you're talking about in terms of home ownership or just more broadly on uh, home equity? Two, two quick things. I'll say um, kind of both and. I mean, I, I, I would comment that um, um, our, our partners have um, been excellent in the sense that they have asked us and, and our kind of collaboratives, you know, what are the things that we know work and what kind of investment will it take um, to double down on those things? And so there is a tendency, uh, a temptation to overthink the home ownership the home ownership um, kind of conundrum. But again, we know that you know the major barriers um, depressing black home ownership specifically here include credit, student loan debt, and a lack of information and resources for first time, especially first generation home buyers. It's 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 not that more complex than that, guys. And and I think you know um, the solutions are you know special purpose credit programs and products, down payment assistance, pools of funds laser targeted to communities of, of color in a kind of through an equity lens. But I think the main thing is that you don't need to kind of ideate and, and, and kind of in an iterative way too much to kind of kind of sex up this formula. We really understand that it's kind of, you know, we're talking about communities that are, well, one, I mean, this kind of intersexual dynamic, intersectional dynamic where you know, where there are food deserts, there are financial services deserts. Where there are financial services deserts, those folks might be off the grid and not plugged in um, to, um, to um, like the affordable connectivity program that's just launched by the FCC, for example. This is a place-based conversation. And sometimes, you know, philanthropy encourages us to take our eye off the ball by coming back to this perennial question and tension, you know, is our sector serving people or places? This kind of false choice. And we're trying to put the systems in place so that they touch every nook and cranny um, of, of the country and bring people into the, as I say, the mainstream systems of civil society. And we don't need to overthink the component parts that bring people from not, from not from being disconnected from the home ownership um, pathway and trajectory. Um, we know what can bring them in. We know what can turn their head in terms of getting them prepared for responsible um, and sustainable home ownership. And I do think it's the frontline consumer facing organizations that, that, that are really what I'm talking about. The National Urban League is a national intermediary. We don't serve a soul. We, again, fund our affiliates to test and learn um, incredible opportunities that we require philanthropy to, to support, to undergird, and to legitimize. Um, and I think in many cases, it's with other people's money. I think we need to be smart here um, around how do we you know, latch on to those things that we know work and talk to every sector in terms of how they can you know, accelerate and proliferate those ideas and concepts. And so I would say there's that. I do think there has been a little bit of an awakening and a pause and a, a little bit of a listening. At the same time, though, you know, every sector, in, in, in mine and, and others, are always looking for those economies of scale. Um, and in terms of how they fund and the my glass is half empty at times when our partners play this what I call civil rights Olympics, you know, kind of we'll fund the black community for this the Latinos will do this the Asians will do this. Even though the reality is, as you pointed out, we're living cheek by jowl communities of color are, are um, a pastiche of of of, of um, a, a America and, and the world um, and the solutions, while, you know, kind of. Um, you know, being devised for particular constituencies, um, you know, have currency everywhere. And is the, I think that is the pathway um, to, to, to getting the kind of political dimension filled in here. Because again, home ownership, you know, and, and, and asset building and asset preservation should be, you know, puppy dogs and ice cream, mom and apple pie, everyone should want that. But again, this equity conversation require, you know, requires necessarily winners and losers in that um, debate, or at least that's the kind of um, 
superficial understanding as to how it works. I think we need to create, again, that bigger tent and resist and reject um, platforms that require us necessarily to compete against one another, community by community, um, for, you know, kind of um, to, to win and lose. But more so, how can we test and, you know, kind of affirm those platforms and policy stances that work with intentionality, not stumbling upon them, but how can we get behind them and build that kind of deep roster of participants, but also actors and commentators um, that can do, again, you know, um, that uh, um, you know, broadening the collaborative, you know, the, the depth of bench concept. And I do think the nonprofit sector is best poised for that, but only when listened to by philanthropy. And I think that is a great team uh, uh, to, to be struck there. And in my mind, that's kind of where we are at the moment. Wow, if I could skip around my office, I would do that right now. That was that was uh, a really great presentation. Um, when you're running for office, let me know. I'm voting and I'll mobilize people as well. <laughs> that, was, that was really great. Uh, Kyle, um, let's come back to United Way of Rhode Island. Um, we, we've stated already your, your funder, um, as well as a fundraiser. Um, so when you're in the grant making role, do you want to elaborate a little bit more on how you're approaching, um, decolonization or even expand more into this larger question, um, specifically in housing equity as you prefer? Yeah, I, I probably will talk a little bit about both. Um, and I, I love the idea of going back to COVID, like the onset of COVID. Um, we were in a race to the bottom. We had resources that had to be deployed in the community immediately to keep agencies afloat, to keep individuals housed and people fed. Um, but in order to do that, we had to rapidly deploy those resources and only the organizations that were most ready could apply in time to get the resources. And we started with banks. We encouraged banks to give to um, small businesses, but they chose to give to their large business friends and they gave more money for payroll protection than they did to, to large businesses than they did to small. Even in the nonprofit sector, we rushed to get dollars out to the to our fellow colleagues, um, but we did that based on who was able to apply first, which means you had to be ready. You had to submit the documentation as we're reporting back to the Fed and back to Commerce. So you had to have certain documentation that not every small nonprofit has access to immediately. You had to have board authorization, which not every small nonprofit can convene in a hurry. So we realized quickly that we were missing the mark yet again on dollars that were deployed with the intent of saving the people and agencies that needed our help the most first. So as we look at United Way and, and flipping that dial, really thinking about how and where we serve, we're in the midst of a, of a competitive grant process now, and we're using as part of our guide, does the organization serve uh, people of color, BIPOC communities? Is it led also by someone who looks like the population that they're serving? By led, I mean board design, construct, geography, demographics, um, executive team, leadership team. Do they look like the people they're serving? Do they interact in the communities that they're serving? Or are they simply doing good work, right? And, and, and that happens as well. But by being intentional about where we're deploying resources and who we're looking to partner with for this next round of, of this current RFP, we hope that what we'll see is that we're using more intentionality around the investment strategy considering we have limited dollars. So as I think of it from a fundraiser and one that invests in, an organ, in a community, we're trying to live into our values uh, that are steeped in our strategic plan and, and just about everything else that we do but also finding it challenging to, to be intent enough to slow down to a point where we can actually hear from the communities that we're serving. And that's a challenge because everyone needs to move fast. So in, the order, in order to move fast, we sometimes skip over our priorities so that we can get the work done and report back to those who have invested in us, whether they're private donors, government, or others. Thank you. Truly insightful. Um, we're getting some of our first questions from the audience, so uh, I'll toss those out. And for panelists, just so you know, I'll put them in the chat before I verbalize them, so you at least have one moment to look at them. Um, the first one is, how can small foundations with limited funding capacity, say five million annually, participate in the movement to advance housing equity in New York? Are there funder collaboratives we can join to combine forces with others? what recommendations might you have? 
I'd start if I could. Uh, here in Rhode Island, we've partnered with a group that has created a series of reports called the State of Black Rhode Island. And we're looking at how to eliminate the housing disparity for Black Rhode Islanders. And one of the key recommendations is simply creating pools of opportunity to invest by creating alternative financing products, by addressing, um, as I said, the credit disparity that exists, which we know uh, primarily is due to the algorithms that design our, our credit reporting systems, but also due to the lack of opportunity, you have a chance to create a financing strategy that helps to close the gap in terms of home ownership. You can be, you can partner with a local nonprofit, a community development corporation. You can partner with another funder. You can invest with a bank or alongside of a bank, except you're highlighting the specific populations you wanna drive change for. So if you have $5 million a year and you invest in something like a revolving fund that has an ongoing opportunity to allow for folks to borrow the money that they need, sometimes to acquire a home, other times to renovate a home so that they can stay in it in an affordable fashion, you now can be closing the gap in terms of home ownership and helping to keep people who are currently housed staying, staying in their housing longer term. Uh, if I could just add to that, Matt, if I, great point, Kyle, if I could just add specific to New York, um, even though we are in New York, the National Urban League, and we have affiliates throughout the state, we um, have take a national lens to this question. But, it, but in New York, this is in many cases where the action's at. So two things I'd say. First is uh, we're a part of the, the five borough housing movement um, to um, ensure that the, the governor's bud budget um, includes um, platforms and practices that make it easier to convert offices to homes, including a tax incentive to help create affordable housing. That is a kind of collaborative built upon, you know, civil rights leaders, labor unions, community action groups, builders and designers, owners, those, those important components to the housing question um, that are sometimes behind the scenes we need allies um, in that work, um, in, that, in that kind of advocacy, um, expending shoe leather in all the in other places to ensure that this is, becomes a mainstream, not just a nicety, not just an esoteric issue, but central, uh, again, to the, the meta concern on narrowing the racial wealth gap. And then nationally, I'm the national co-chair of what's called the, the Black Home Ownership Collaborative, which is a, a, a multi you know, kind of cross-sectoral um, um, collaborative that is, uh, has des been designed uh, to identify, as I say, the things that we know work. There are seven recommendations that are statutory, regulatory, and legislative that we believe deserve investment and attention now. Many of them were in, in, um, in, um, included in um, President Biden's um, Build Back Better initiative. Politics kind of kneecap that, but I do think um, Neighborhood Homes Investment Act, down payment assistance for communities of color, those are the platforms that have currency that we're looking for supporters. The public facing dimension to that work is, a, is I, and I'd like to draw people towards it, it's um, 3by30.org. The, the, the notion is how do we generate 3 million net new black homeowners by 2030? We know the inputs, we know um, what kind of dials and switches are available to us, um, in terms of um, the public sector, the private sector, and philanthropy, I do um, encourage folks to to peruse www.3by30.org to see if we're on the right track. Excellent. We'll get those into the uh, chat here so everyone can see those as well. Thank you. Um, so, second question from the audience. Um, maybe Aubrey, if I can have you start with this one, you haven't spoken a little bit, you're in the middle and we haven't had a beginning and an end. So, uh, what do you see the roles for public funding versus private funding versus philanthropy in driving change by private funding there? Um, I assume, uh, the questioner means, um, for-profit entities. Yeah, I the way I see it, and I love the way you framed the question. Um, Right now, life moves is in a hockey stick growth phase where we're um, developing, building, and bringing online new interim supportive housing communities, just as I said earlier, to bring people off the street quickly. Inherent in that approach has been the realization that uh, creative public-private partnerships are critical in this work and even just in the sector as well, and how you define that. Um, but for, for us, uh, harnessing public funds and then leveraging them with private sources of capital are able there, and that helps us accelerate execution. And so we have projects like uh, Project Home Key, where we're bringing together public, private, and a philanthropic community 
to all conspire together to sort of create momentum. So I think there are roles that they each play. And I think the role that I'd like to see them play more. So yeah, we want to invest. We want to make some impact investment. We want to make some responsive grant making. Uh, we want to make sure that we're funding projects um, that we think are going to have an impact. And side of your point, um, one of the things that we are trying to inform is sort of knee-jerk reaction funding, right? Funding that comes with intentionality, that comes with an eye for sustainability, that comes with the recognition that we can't fund people off of a budget surplus because that's in no way anywhere reliable. And um, housing is fundamental, so the funding should be fundamental. We should not have to rely on, you know, the luck of how we perform from a state perspective any given year. And so I think what I would encourage is public private partnerships and philanthropy. We have examples, like I mentioned before, where we've come together and the direction that I think uh, where I'd like to see it go and we're having conversations is how you develop the narrative. How do you coalesce that power and leverage that in a coherent way so you could begin to look at policies? Can you, you could begin to look at sort of how do we wrap the narrative around the work that we're doing in housing? How, how are we? How are we shaping the lens for which we view this work? And how is that impacting how philanthropy, how funding, how investments are driven? And what's the macro strategy around that and behind that? And to your point, Sai, how are we looking at those folks that are on the ground doing the work? How are we really authentically undergirding? How are we able to fuel testing and learning? How are we able to sort of recognize what's working? And how are we able to um, be a catalyst for additional private public funding um, that's creative, that's innovative, that allows the best work to be happening on the ground. So that's that's sort of what we're seeing. I know every state is different, every environment is different, but I think what we're seeing um, in my part of the world here in Northern California is sort of that recognition. There is a there is a a funders network. Um, it's the Bay Area's funders network, and they're it's a partnership between Northern California grant makers and different funders and philanthropic um, contributors to end homelessness. And so the partnership really draws on bringing together philanthropy to build healthy, thriving communities in Northern California. So as you start having those entities is how do you get them from vertical silos to more horizontally integrated to expand and having a more coherent conversation. So that's what we're seeing. I think there is a role, as I wrap up here, there is a role for public-private partnerships. And I think that is also a way to drive and accelerate creativity, both in the funding stream, but in unlocking and unleashing the work and innovation that needs to happen on the ground. Thank you. I want to stick on this question for one more moment and add um, a little bit uh, more complexity. The public-private partnerships, uh, an area of special uh, interest um, for me, and we did have a panel on um, private funding of social infrastructure uh, earlier this week. There are a couple of interesting points brought up that I want to see how they hit all of you. One of them was the success of Amazon's housing equity fund um, they created a fund, I believe it was $3 billion, um, and deployed money to create 20,000 new uh, units in um, three specific geographic areas where they are involved, um, and were able to deploy and get all of that work out there um, within, I think, two years, uh, 20,000 units. So it was quite a big, uh, a, a big effect, obviously very targeted to where that private entity um, had implications. But we see this larger impact of all this ESG money. We've seen trillions of dollars raised that is supposed to address environmental, social inequity, and um, governance issues in communities. I don't know if we've seen any of that money, like Amazon's money, go into local communities to try to um, get some of these uh, housing outcomes, or maybe um, from the philanthropic lens, seeing um, DAF or even um, PRI, Program Related Investments, where we could use that 95% corpus actually to be invested in things that are um, positive uh, for a community and not have on one hand investing in you know terrible things to the corpus and then using the 5% for something else. So I give you a lot of background to 
a lot of room to move there, but uh, I'm curious if you've seen any other of these trends or think that they might be helpful to you um, in continuing to pursue housing equity um, in this new world. And I'll just weigh in quickly if I if I if I could, Matt, to that. Um, the the, fir the first thing is I I do think. Um, you know, we need to be mindful. Again, this is a unit of analysis question. I mean, we're talking about billions of dollars um, in a hurry going to places that 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 may lack the or there may be a dearth of institutional actors to facilitate that flow of funds. We don't want to be in the business of waterboarding communities by overflowing them with with dollars because there's been you know a, a lack of investment and a dearth of institutional actors to help facilitate that kind of um, special investment. So I think. The comprehensive look at, again at places and do they have the readiness and capacity um, to make use and to optimize that kind of funding is an important question alongside that. But also, and I do think again, I mentioned this this moment of um, community empowerment. I mean, you know, the, the Urban League just launched its own CDFI, its own lending platform. Um, you know, focusing on small business expansion and, and housing development. And I do think, you know, we're looking for um, the ability to kind of learn as we go, learn as we do. Um, in many cases, the institutional knowledge and capacity building for minority led, minority serving institutions who have organic connections to these places is measurable. And I think is worthy of an area of investment um, and, and innovation as to how best and efficiently to get those dollars in a way that makes sense, in a cadence that makes sense for organizations that have already, you know, traversed that trust hurdle and barrier. Because mm -hmm. you're dealing with mm -hmm. cynical constituencies and, and 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 communities, you need that trusted voice that goes alongside the investment. One without the other doesn't work. Kyle, you want to add anything to this topic or should we move on? I would just say quickly, in addition to capacity and infrastructure, I would say we also have to have the public will to move these projects forward. Um, mm -hmm. This is something that is a great debate at this time. And there is a preconceived notion about what affordable housing is and what it is not. I think we're talking about housing that my parents can move into, that my daughter can now purchase or my granddaughter would be safe in. And remain in our communities, right? We want people to be able to transition through housing effectively so that older housing stock becomes available for newer families as older adults transition to safe, affordable, healthy places for them to remain housed. That's the only thing I'd say. We have to have the public will and remove the partisan politics from the discussion because we're really talking about human beings being housed effectively, financially, healthily, right? That's, that's it. Safe, affordable, healthy housing for everyone. Thank you. So I'm getting the nudge that I need to drive us toward close. So I'm going to give each of you a chance in a sentence or two. What is it that you want our audience to take away, to leave with? We covered a lot of topics here. Give us a sentence or two of the most important thing. If they don't go back and watch the recording and take notes, uh, what do you want them to be able to say when they, they see their friends and colleagues um, happened here? So we'll go uh, Aubrey, Kyle, and then side to close. Thank you for that, just needed to unmute. Um, two quick points. One, philanthropy is not some sort of sport or brand of ice cream. So whether or not you're a Jets fan, a Giants fan, you know, an Eagles fan, um, you know, or if you choose mint chocolate or rock, Rocky Road, philanthropy matters and it has an impact. And oftentimes it can mean the difference between life or death and the work that's being done. So understand sort of what it is without overanalyzing it, but it is important. The second thing is for those of uh, you that are in the nonprofit space doing this work is, um, I, I'm boring a quote now and I, I don't know the author of the quote, but nonprofit work is as good as the white supremacy and other forms of injustice it dismantles. Anything less is just charity. So understand where you fall on that line and understand where your relationship with philanthropy falls on, uh, on that line. And philanthropist, understand where you fall on that line as well too. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here and sharing with this esteemed uh, um, group of brilliant speakers. I guess I'll go next. Yeah, go ahead, Kyle, uh, sorry. That's okay. Urban, urban redevelopment projects have displaced communities of color and indigenous populations in both Rhode Island and throughout this country over the last 400 years. 
let's break down the, the barriers and assumptions that people who are poor or without housing or unstably housed have done this to themselves. Let's acknowledge it for what it is, one. And then two, use creative financing opportunities that close the opportunity gap for low and very low income households. This is housing that no one is building. As the federal government has departed ways from producing more affordable housing for low and very low income households, we recognize that this is the most significant challenge. It costs more to educate kids who are unstably housed. The kids end up in the correction system sooner and more often than their counterparts who have safe, affordable, healthy housing. Invest in low and very low income household production. Matt, Matt, I'll just I'll just say this, and that it may be a bit harsh, but um, you know, um, for our allies, it's not just what's been said, but by whom. So you know, a legacy of housing and lending discrimination, which excluded Black and Brown households from communities, denied them access to credit, and constrained opportunities to build household equity, all contributed significantly to the home ownership gap we witness today between African Americans and White Americans. So to my philanthropic allies and partners, it's showtime. You're on. Excellent. Um, thank you, Sai. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Aubrey. Um, thank you all for joining us for How Philanthropy Can Advance Housing Equity, which is a collaboration between Aperio Philanthropy and the George H. Heyman Jr. Program for Philanthropy and Fundraising within NYU SPS Center for Global Affairs. Um, thanks so much uh, to our co-hosts, Bianca and Michelle, and uh, all of you have a great day.